Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to share with you some of our thinking at the Cleveland Clinic about healthcare education. Uh, and the Cleveland Clinic is now 94 years old. It was formed by these four gentlemen who fought together in World War I and realized that they could do better working as a unit than they could do individually. And they had three things that they wanted to do. Uh, care for the sick, investigate their problems, and educate those who serve. And I'd like to talk a little bit about the latter. First of all, the Cleveland Clinic is a not-for-profit organization. It is a group practice, the second largest group practice in the United States with 3,000 uh, physicians. We have, for better or for worse, physician leadership. Um, and we are all salaried with no financial incentives or bonuses. We have annual professional reviews, which we take very seriously, spending about 8,000 man hours on those each year. And we have one-year contracts. I personally have had 41 year, uh, 41 one-year contracts, always get a little nervous at that time of the year. <laughs> we are deeply involved in education. Uh, we have almost uh, 1,900 residents and fellows in training and the third largest residency program in the United States. 12 years ago, we formed a new medical school, the first in 25 years, the Lerner College of Medicine at Case Western Reserve University. It is a unique medical school. It is to train physicians, investigators, uh, and it is five years. One of the years is devoted to uh, research. There are 32 students who come in each year. They have full scholarships. It is tuition free. Uh, we have a problem-based curriculum and there are no grades, le uh, lectures, or class ranking. The class has uh, attracted an incredible group of individuals. It's now the fifth highest MedCAD scores of entering medical school students in the country. And uh, we've also begun to think a little bit about how we train them. Right now, uh, healthcare education is divided with medical schools, dental schools, nursing schools, physician assistant schools, all being trained individually in silos. And many of you will recognize that teamwork is not a natural act for physicians. <laughs> so we wanted to do away with the silos. Uh, and so what we are doing is building a new campus uh, that will include uh, the Cleveland Clinic Learner College of Medicine, Case Western Reserve's Medical School, Nursing School, Dental School, and Physician Assistant School, all in one facility. And I'd like to show you what this foster design building will look like. We think when we bring everyone together in one space, it will begin to foster uh, the teamwork that's needed in healthcare as we see it today. We're also looking at new technology to bring into uh, this facility. As we have a partnership with IBM, and Watson is currently going to medical school at the Cleveland Clinic. Watson is a very good student, can read the entire medical literature in an hour and a half and remember it all. The only problem with Watson is it's not much fun on Saturday night. Um, and we, we know that as the knowledge in healthcare doubles every two years, that it's going to be impossible for an individual to manage all this. And we think that they're going to require significant computer help. And this is uh, our attempt to do this. Watson can currently now take uh, the history, the physical, the laboratory findings, and come up with a problem list uh, from those, uh, that learning. We also have a partnership with Microsoft, and Microsoft has developed HoloLens, which is these virtual reality goggles, and we think they show enormous potential. And I'd like to show you a video of what this looks like. Mm. 
Mark is part of a team from Case Western and the Cleveland Clinic. We invited them to use Windows Holographic to advance medical education beyond what is possible with today's state of the art. Take it away. Thanks, Alex. Today we use a combination of cadavers and medical illustrations to teach students anatomy. This is a curriculum that hasn't drastically changed in over 100 years because there simply hasn't been another way. The mixed reality of the HoloLens has the potential to revolutionize this education by bringing 3D content into the real world. Now, one of the biggest challenges for students learning anatomy is understanding the body in three dimensions and how all the different systems fit together. Using holograms, we can easily separate and focus in on individual systems. For example, we can focus in on the femur, and students can immediately see some of the types of fractures they may one day encounter in the clinic. Now, I can leverage all of these new capabilities while maintaining the important connection with my students. When we're both wearing a HoloLens, I can see what they're looking at, what they're interacting with, I can assess their progress, and they can communicate with me and each other naturally. For example, I can see if Michelle has a question in class, or whether Gwen has a question while learning remotely. Now, obviously, a cadaver doesn't move. This makes it difficult to see the way a living body actually works. HoloLens doesn't have this limitation. Systems can be animated to easily see how things function. Let's take a look at the center of the cardiovascular system, the heart. It's an amazing organ. In reality, it's about the size of your fist. With HoloLens, we can easily scale up the heart to let students see minute details. We can even see inside the heart to see the valves in action. This is a new way of seeing things, and it has the potential to help students understand the structure and physiology of the body in a way that's just not possible today. Now, what you've just seen is a vision of how HoloLens could enhance one single subject. Imagine for a moment some of the other fields that could benefit from this technology. This could change how everyone learns. You can imagine that this has poten tremendous potential, and we think that we now can begin to teach anatomy without a cadaver. In fact, our new facility will not have laboratories for cadavers. <clears throat> I'd like to also uh, begin to uh, talk a little bit about textbooks. We're working with McGraw-Hill uh, and their uh, new smart book, and an opportunity to begin to uh, lose the textbook, lose the e-book, and begin to use smart books. Uh, these have the, uh, they're fully integrated, they're interactive, and very rich in media. Now, if you look at textbooks currently, uh, the way they are for the students, it's linear experience. Uh, in the smart book, it will be personalized, uh, there'll be a track of your, prog uh, your progress, and it will be focused on the things that you need to learn. If you look at the faculty, they assign the reading. Now they'll be able to monitor that activity and get data that will begin to drive changes in how you begin to educate and make education uh, more meaningful. And if you look at the content experts, which generally increase the textbooks or improve the textbooks every three years, you now can have real feedback and content can be constantly upgraded. So we think that this is enormous opportunity to begin to change the way learning is carried out. Finally, you know, I would like to take a moment or two, if I could, to talk about uh, one thing that we think is very important and shouldn't be lost in our education. And that is the subject of empathy. It's easy in physicians to become technicians. I, in the past, had become a, a technician uh, as a cardiac surgeon and realized that it was now important that we do something um, substantially uh, more significant. And so we put together this training film, which is now part of the education of medical students, and I'd like to share it with you.
I think this uh, serves to remind us of the sacred obligation and the sacred privilege that we have as caregivers and that we can never lose sight of the importance of empathy in a highly technical profession. Thank you very much.